symposium uh, yesterday, uh, uh, day before yesterday, talking about uh, biodiversity hosted by Penn State. And, um, you know, all of us in our little screens here in our Zoom rooms, um, it really comes back to biodiversity and the effect, the kind of the crisis of biodiversity and the effect that uh, people are having on, on the globe. Uh, and um, so it really ties in so well to, um, to Doug Tallamy's work and his ability to get people excited about doing what they can in their own backyard or in the, the, the piece of land that you uh, manage or control, whether that's your backyard, your community garden plot, um, a, a park in your community that um, you can support and help with, uh, uh, school grounds. There are so many ways that we can take action. Um, sometimes it's hard to know what that action can be. Uh, Doug Tallamy is an author, a professor, a ecologist, uh, and as I said, one of the things I really appreciate about Doug's work is taking that research and he gives us practical mechanisms that everyone can use to, um, to help support biodiversity and uh, local ecosystem help, health. Some of Doug's uh, books I've uh, put up here on the slide, Nature's Best Hope. Um, uh, Doug has a new book coming out and um, we're hoping to get Doug uh, back to, um, to teach about that book uh, on, on Oaks. Oh, sorry, there we go, Doug, I'm stopping the share. Um, so hoping to have another, another webinar with Doug to talk about Oaks. Um, and, but today's talk, Restoring Nature's Relationships at Home. So Doug, thank you so much for being with us. Um, folks, uh, um, a virtual welcome uh, for Doug Tallamy. Thank you, Denise. <laughs> Uh, and thanks for everybody coming from, from near and far. I do want to talk about bringing nature home or restoring nature's relationships at home. But before we do that, we have to recognize what nature is. Uh, and, and for the most part, it is a series of very specialized relationships. And here are some examples. This is the resplendent quetzal in the uh, forests of, of Central America. It's an endangered bird and it's endangered for one primary reason, it has a very specialized diet. If you don't have fruits of the wild avocado tree, you don't have quetzals. And of course, we have cut down most of the wild avocado trees. Uh, but figured out that if we want quetzals, we can put those trees back. And that's what these, these folks are doing right here. That's an avocado tree right there. Fortunately, it grows pretty quickly and reaches the age at which it produces those fruits in not too many years. And it's starting to look better for the future of that beautiful bird. Same story with jaguars, believe it or not. If you want to have jaguars, you have to have particular species of palm trees. Why palm trees? Because they make palm nuts. And palm nuts happen to be the favorite food of peccaries, which is the favorite food of jaguars. So this is specialization uh, and, and particularly specialization focused on food webs. It's the rule in nature rather than the exception. And it always starts with plants. Now, a lot of people think you get all that specialization in the tropical areas of the world because there is so much specialization there. But actually, some of the most specialized relationships that have ever evolved occur right in our yards up here in the temperate zone. And this is one of them. This is a female bola spider. And it's obvious why she's called a bola spider. She does not spin a web. She simply drops a single strand of silk and puts one sticky glob of glue at the end there. Um, now, she doesn't swing it her, around her head like a, a bola, but um, she does go fishing with it. Looks like she lowers it and raises it and lowers it real slowly. And the first time I watched her do that, this is a picture from a, a spider in my yard. I told her, I said, you're not going to catch anything because it seemed to me a web was a much better idea rather than have something flying into that single target by accident. But about 15 seconds later, a moth flew in and got stuck on her, her sticky glob of glue and she reeled it in, manipulated it for quite some time and actually turned it into an egg mess. She laid eggs there and that's what a bola spider egg mess looks like. What I didn't know at the time is that uh, the moth did not fly in there by accident. She was releasing the sex pheromone of that particular species of moth. So uh, that's a male. He thought she was a female. She was, but the wrong species. Uh, and that was the end of him. Uh, and it turns out that every species of bola spider in, in the world mimics a sex pheromone of particular species of moths. So you can have bola spiders in your yard if you have the plant that supports the larval development of the moth that your bola spider is mimicking the sex pheromone of. Very specialized relationship. This is Phlox divaricata, common spring ephemeral in the east. It spreads readily from seed, but only if it's pollinated. And if you look at the entrance to that corolla, it's extremely small, very narrow. I've watched uh, native bees land on these flowers and try to get their, their mouth parts in there. 
they can't do it. It's too small of a hole. So who's pollinating our flocks? It turns out the major pollinators are day flying sphinx moths, things like the hummingbird sphinx or the snowberry clearwing. They have very long tongues and they sink them deep into the corolla of those flowers. And when they pull them out, they're covered with pollen and they fly to the next flower. And that's how your flocks are getting pollinated. So you can get your flocks pollinated, make lots of seed if you have adult snowberry clearwings. And you can have adult snowberry clearwings if you have larval snowberry clearwings. You can have larval snowberry clearings if you have coral honeysuckle. That is their host plant, the native honeysuckle. Even animals we don't think of as having specialized relationship with plants often do. And I'm going to use uh, the Carolina chickadee as an example. Um, this, by the way, the uh, uh, Native Americans called the Carolina chickadee the bird of truth. So everything a chickadee tells us is the absolute truth. Um, they, of course, are common birds. All the chickadees in, in the country are common birds that are feeder in the wintertime, uh, where at least 50% of their diet is, is seed. But when they uh, reproduce, when it's time to, to, to lay eggs and rear young, they switch from seeds. Their babies cannot eat seeds. And that is true for, for most of the terrestrial birds in North America. They can't eat seeds. So the, the birds switch to insects. And most of those insects are caterpillars. In a healthy environment, they'll feed their, their young exclusively on caterpillars if they get the chance. Uh, and they are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds are rearing their young on insects. And most of those insects are caterpillars. So what's special about caterpillars? It must be something. It's actually several things uh, special about caterpillars. Uh, and one is that they are soft. Uh, so think of this guy as a, as a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is uh, cuticle. It's exoskeleton. It's undigestible. The birds don't want a lot of that. And because it's soft, you can stuff that, that caterpillar down the, the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring it. Uh, and if you've ever watched a parent bird feed their young, they're pretty rough. Their beak's like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. Uh, one medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. So some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but uh, do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They are nutritious. They are, are uh, very high in protein, high in fat, low percentage of chitin compared to many other insects, particularly beetles, which are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. Uh, much of a beetle is undigestible, and they also have a lot of sharp edges. And it turns out that uh, uh, caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. <clears throat> now I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates and vertebrates cannot make their own carotenoids. We have to get them from plants uh, and we have to get them from plants because they are essential components of vertebrate diets. Well, chickadees are, are vertebrates, uh, not making their own carotenoids, so they have to get them from plants, but they're not eating plants, particularly when they are, are uh, breeding. So they have to get them from something that did eat plants, and that something is uh, insects and other invertebrates. <clears throat> but if you look at carotenoid content across uh, uh, bird prey items, you'll see it's not at all equal. Caterpillars, these are two types of caterpillars here, have far more carotenoids than other types of, of uh, insect prey items. The third bar here are orthopteroids, things like grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids. Here are the adult uh, caterpillars down here, the, the moths and the butterflies themselves, far fewer carotenoids because they are not eating green leaves. And then we have the earthworm way down here. The early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. Uh, so it's looking like there's a lot of data that suggests that uh, caterpillars may not be optional parts of bird diets. It's looking like they are essential parts of bird diets, which means there can be no chickadees if we don't have enough caterpillars. And that brings us to the next question. How many is enough caterpillars? How many caterpillars does it take to make a clutch of chickadees? And the answer is it takes a lot. Uh, and it was these birds that actually taught me that. Uh, uh, several years ago now, I uh, was interested in what ch chickadees were feeding their young. So I put up a chickadee box and set up my camera. The idea was to take pictures of what they were bringing back to the, to the nest. And the first thing I noticed is that they were bringing back caterpillars to the nest really fast. Went about one caterpillar every three minutes, which amazed me. I look for caterpillars in my yard all the time. I do not find one caterpillar every three minutes. <clears throat> in one 27 minute period, they brought back 30 caterpillars. How do they do that? By bringing back more than one at a time and sometimes a whole bunch. And they're doing this all day long, 6 a.m. to about 8 p.m. So they're working really hard. Uh, the next question is how many species of caterpillars do they bring back to the nest? Well, during one three hour period when I was watching, they brought back 17 species of, of caterpillars. 
And that is a really important point. Uh, remember, chickadees are foraging about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying uh, five miles down the road to the, to the nearest woodlot. So if you want chickadees breeding in your yard, you have to have what they need in your yard. Uh, and apparently I had 17 species of caterpillars in my yard that they found within three hours. That is important because um, if I had one or two species of caterpillar in, in my yard, and it happened to be a bad year for those species. All species uh, fluctuate. Good times they go up, bad times they go down. There wouldn't be nearly enough caterpillars to, to meet the needs of those baby chickadees. But if I have 17 species or 34 species or 134 species, and I've actually started counting, these guys uh, uh, motivated me to start taking pictures of all the caterpillars I have in, in our yard. I'm up to 1,030 species of caterpillars in our yard which means there will always be enough caterpillars to be able to meet the needs of these breeding birds, regardless of where they are in their population fluctuations. Even if it's a cold, rainy spring, there's still enough caterpillars around. So that is the advantage of, of diversity in this food web. Diversity is stabilizing the food web. The chickadee gets to breed every year because I've got a lot of species of caterpillars in the yard. So you've heard diversity is good. Uh, this is the main reason. Diversity creates stability in the food web and the ecosystem. Well, a guy by the name of, of Brewer, uh, and just a, a quick story, I don't want to take a lot of time here, but I got an email the other day. Uh, this is Richard Brewer, uh, and uh, he's still alive. He's in a nursing home in, in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and he, he saw one of my books and realized that I'm quoting him all the time. I didn't think he was still with us, but uh, he was. He did this study a long time ago on Carolina chickadees, looking at the number of caterpillars they bring back to the nest every day. And it's between 390 and 570 caterpillars every day. Uh, and they feed their, their young in the nest for 16 days. Now, then they fledge uh, and, and they're flying all around and the parents continue to feed them another 21 days. But just to the point where they, they uh, leave the nest, that's 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars required to make one clutch of chickadees, depending on the number of chicks in the nest. That's a lot of caterpillars. Uh, and chickadees are tiny. They are, are a third of an ounce. What if I wanted to have a red belly woodpecker in my yard? They're eight times heavier than a chickadee. How many caterpillars does that take? And of course, I don't want just chickadees and red belly woodpeckers. I want scarlet tanagers and tip mice and blue jays and bluebirds and tree swallows and, and common yellow throats and indigo bunnings and towhees and yellow warblers and wood thrushes and wrens and cardinals and hummingbirds. And I don't want one pair of them. I want breeding populations of all of these guys. How many caterpillars does that take? Uh, and I know what you're thinking. Well, the hummingbird doesn't need any caterpillars because they eat sugar water uh, and they do eat sugar water. But 80 to 90 percent of a hummingbird's diet is insects and, and spiders. And then they go get the sugar water. And that is true for, again, 96 percent of the terrestrial birds in North America. These are the bird families rearing their young uh, primarily on insect protein. When I say directly, that's insect protein. But indirectly, if they eat a spider, the spider needed insects to become a spider. Uh, so, no insects, no baby birds. A little bit of a generalization, but not much, not much. How do we make the, the diversity and abundance of insects that are required uh, in order to have, have these, these breeding birds? And, and, you know, I'm talking about birds, but there's lots of other uh, creatures that require insects as well. Uh, well, to answer that question, we have to go back to specialized relationships. The most common type of specialized relationship in, on the entire planet is the relationship between the insects uh, that eat plants and the plants themselves. So we're not talking about pollinators right now. We're talking about things like this, this polyphemus moth caterpillar and the plant that it's eating. Remember, plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals. Secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective de defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there. It's not because there are no insects out there to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. And if you don't believe me, next, next spring, next summer, go out and eat a plant. See if you like it. You're not going to like it. They're all well protected. There's a reason it's hard to get our kids to eat vegetables. They inherently know that they're toxic. That's a joke. Um, this is not a joke. Insects do eat plants. How do they get around those, those uh, 
all those chemical defenses. Well, this is where the specialization comes in. All plants are protecting themselves with different cocktails of, of, of uh, defensive chemicals and insects cannot adapt to all of them. So they pick one or two plant lineages that are very similar and they get good at getting around those. Uh, defensive compounds. They develop the enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, the behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that allow them to avoid their uh, exposure to those compounds. But it takes a long period of, of evolutionary history with those plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. It does not happen overnight. Uh, let's use the monarch butterfly as an example because you already know uh, half the story of the monarchs you know that they are specialists on milkweeds. That's what they, the only thing they can reproduce on. And you probably know that milkweeds are toxic plants. They are protected by cardiac glycosides. So when you're out there eating plants, don't eat a lot of milkweeds because if you do, it'll stop your heart. That's what cardiac glycosides do. It doesn't stop the monarch's heart. And they do have a heart, by the way, because they've got those, those enzymes that can, can deal with cardiac glycosides. But what about the sticky latex sap that is in milkweed? That's what gives milkweeds it, its common name. When you break open a, a vein on a milkweed leaf, all this white goo comes out. And if you get it on your fingers, you usually wipe it off right away. But if you don't wipe it off uh, and let it, let it uh, be exposed to air, it gels. It turns into a, like chewing gum. Uh, and that's its defensive property. If caterpillars get this on their mandibles, it glues the mouth shut. Uh, and then they starve to death. So that's that's serious stuff. Well, here's a caterpillar that eats milkweed leaves. How does it eat those leaves without gluing its mouth shut? That's a monarch caterpillar, by the way. The first thing it does is go to the end of the leaf and start to eat. And if any sap starts to come out at all, it will stop eating immediately, turn around, crawl back up the leaf, maybe two thirds of the way, and then it starts to chew through the midrib. And it chews and it chews until it is completely severed the midrib. And what it's done is block the canals that shunt the, the latex sap from this end of the leaf to this end of the leaf. So this end of the leaf now doesn't have any latex sap and it can turn around, go back down, and it can eat the leaf without any sap coming out at all. That of course flags the leaves. Uh, so uh, this is a very convenient marker. If you're a, a monarch hunter, you can drive down the road and look at a milkweed patch. And if there are any flag leaves, you know that there are monarchs there. Well, those are the upsides of specialization. By developing those physiological and behavioral adaptations, uh, monarchs are able to get around the defenses of, of their major host plant, milkweeds. And most other insects cannot do that. The downside of specialization is that now that's all monarchs can eat. While they were developing the adaptations that get, help them get around milkweeds, they didn't spend any time developing adaptations to get around the tannins that are in oak leaves or the cucurbitacins in cucurbits or the nicotine in tobacco or the cyanide in cherry. Um, all those plants are protecting themselves. And the only thing the monarchs are defended against are milkweeds. That's host plant specialization. And of course, if we take milkweeds out of the landscape, that's why we lose monarchs. They can't eat anything else. And that's what we've done over the years. Uh, way back in, in 2013, um, there were only 3.6% of the monarchs left. So that's why we've got these national efforts to put milkweeds back. Host plant specialization is what's going to save the monarch. Uh, it's not just, just moths and butterflies that are specialists. This is the elderberry beetle only eats elderberry. The dogbane beetle only eats dogbane. Sumac flea beetle only eats sumac. This is a Korean bug that only eats ash. Uh, so if the emerald ash borer takes out all of our ashes, uh, and it's certainly doing a good job of doing that, we're going to lose this insect. Dave Wagner did a, a uh, study on uh, all the insects that specialize on ash, and it's about 95 species are going to disappear if we lose our ashes. And that's because so many of the insects that eat plants are host plant specials, about 90% of them. But we can use the knowledge of host plant specialization to actually rebuild landscapes that support our food webs. We just have to know what those food webs are comprised of. And let's use the white-eyed vireo as an example. And I'm going to use that as an example because that's the nest that my wife Cindy found in our yard uh, a few years ago. Uh, now, in order to reconstruct the food web, I've got to take pictures of what, what caterpillars these guys are bringing back to their, their babies and identify them, know what plant uh, created that caterpillar, and then we'll know what plant is necessary to, to uh, feed these white-eyed vireos. Uh, well, the birds must have known that because they built the nest really low, so I could set up my camera and, and take pictures of what they were bringing back. So let's do that. Um, this is the blinded sphinx moth. It's a specialist on black cherry. We have a lot of black cherry at our house making blinded sphinx moths, so the babies get to eat. 
This is the chestnut chisura, and despite its common name, it's a specialist on viburnums. The viburnum at our house is uh, viburnum dentatum. We know that because we planted it. Um, our, our yard was mowed for hay when we moved in, very few things here. So uh, our viburnum dentatums, are, that's arrowwood, are now making chestnut chisuras and the babies get to eat again. This guy with the white stripe is the drab prominent, a specialist on sycamore. And we did not plant sycamores, uh, but uh, maybe two years after we moved in, there was a big wind, blew in some sycamore seeds from who knows where. One landed in our cold frame and germinated. And I am not very fast at weeding things out. That tree is now, I don't know, it's got to be 80 feet tall. Uh, so no more cold frame, but it's making drab prominence so the babies get to eat again. So on and on we go. This is the eight spotted forester moth, a specialist on native grapes. We have lots of those. The lunate zaley, another specialist on black cherry. This is the spice bush swallowtail, a specialist on spice bush and its close relative sassafras. There's the phony eye on its, its uh, prothorax. It's supposed to scare the bird into thinking it's a tree snake. Didn't work uh, this time. Uh, the tufted bird dropping moth, yet another uh, specialist on black cherry. So black cherries emerging is a really important component of this bird's food web. But these guys are hungry. They need a lot more than that. So let's put some black walnut in the landscape. If we do that, we get the walnut sphinx, the gray edge boma loca, the black blotch cesura, the bride, all specialists on black walnut in my yard. Native maples will give us plagodes inchworms, the green stripe maple worm, the maple bentum dagger moth, and of course many others. Native elms, Give us the four horn sphinx, the double tooth prominent, the interrupted dagger moth. And again, these are just examples. Remember 90% of the insects that are required to feed this, this uh, white eyed vireo are not gonna be in our yard unless we have the plants that make those, those insects. So if we want the mustard sallow, we need witch hazel. If we want the hackberry emperor, we need hackberry. If you want coculio asteroides, we need native asters. The arcidra flower moth and brown hooded owlet need goldenrod. The hog sphinx, pandora sphinx, abbot sphinx all need Virginia creeper. The red bud leaf roller needs red bud. The gray furcula needs native willows. Turbulent phosphilla needs green briar. And the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streaked dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laugher, and literally hundreds more species of moss require oaks. Oaks are the most powerful plant you can put in your yard and 84% of the counties. Why do we need all these insects? Well, it's not just for birds. It's not just for birds. Um, all spiders eat insects. I know a lot of people don't, don't like uh, spiders, uh, but look who does. It's the second most important component of, of bird food webs. Uh, plus spiders are really important uh, predators. You know, we, we go out of our way to kill spiders and then we hire Mosquito Joe to, to spray and kill everything when the, the spiders would have done a good job. Uh, have a lot of insect predators out there that are eating uh, insect herbivores. So if we lost our herbivores, we would lose the insect predators and they themselves are part of, of uh, important food webs as well. If we lost our insects, we would lose our frogs, we'd lose our toads, we would lose all the amphibians because they all need insects. We'd lose our lizards, we'd lose our bats, we'd lose our rodents, believe it or not. A lot of people think rodents eat seed and they do eat seeds when they can't find enough insects. And the reason they want insects is that insects are really good food. Pound for pound, there's twice as much protein in insect meat as there is in beef. And insects have organis uh, organs in their abdomen called fat bodies that are loaded with, with uh, lipids that are high energy compounds that allow these little guys to grow quickly and reproduce quickly. And if you're a mouse, that's what you want to do because there's a lot of things that want to eat you. Same reason larger organisms love insects. They're just really good food. The skunk is digging up your yard to get the grubs that are in your yards. Possums eat a lot of insects. Raccoons eat a lot of insects. Even things we don't think of as insectivores eat a lot of insects like the red fox. 25% of its diet is insects, full quarter of its diet. 23% of a black bear's diet is insects. So it doesn't matter how, how big you are, you require insects. And even if you don't eat insects, you need insects. This is a sharp shin hawk. Um, it's a bird specialist, it eats other birds. And you might think, well, I can have sharp shin hawks in my neighborhood, even if I get rid of all my insects. But think about it. If you get rid of all your insects, you got rid of the birds that this guy eats. So he needs them indirectly. So does the garter snake. He's not uh, eating a lot of insects directly. He's eating the frogs and toads that ate the insects. 
So a world without insects is a world without biological diversity. And E.O. Wilson told us decades ago that a world without biological diversity is a world without humans. And he meant it. And E.O. is never wrong. So what's happening to the species that, that uh, insects rely on? If we get, get rid of insects, what happens? Well, um, you know, we, we study birds a lot because people like birds and the news is, is not good. There are 432 species of North American birds that are now at risk of extinction, according to the State of the Birds report. Uh, and it's not that there's only four individuals left of each species. It's, it's the rate of decline of their populations is now the signal of impending extinction. Um, People say we got to slow the rate of decline. No, we have to stop the rate of decline and have them increase or they're going to go extinct. There are now 3 billion fewer breeding birds uh, in the US compared to just 50 years ago. That's from a paper that came out in 2019. That's a third of the North American bird population gone. Well, why can't, why can't biodiversity, why can't all these species be sustained in the parks and preserves that we have? We have a lot of parks and preserves out there. Um, there's a couple answers, but but um, the big one is they're too small. When you take a, a, a big habitat like this and you shrink it down to a little habitat fragment, and this is an exaggeration, it doesn't have to be this small. You're taking large populations and shrinking them down to small populations. And that's the problem. Small populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction. Why? Because all populations fluctuate and good times they go up, bad times they go down. If you're a large population, this top line here, even in your down cycle, there's enough individuals so you can increase quickly when times get better. But if you're a tiny population, these normal fluctuations, you often hit zero. You blink out of your little habitat fragment. And then unless you recolonize, uh, you're permanently gone. That's local extinction. Uh, and most of the time you can't recolonize because your habitat is so isolated from other habitats. So studies from all over, all over the world uh, at this point are telling us the same thing. The, the natural areas we have left on planet Earth in so many places are not large enough to sustain the amount of nature we need to sustain humans. And not only are, are the viable habitats that we have uh, left, not only are they fragmented, they, they've also been invaded by uh, plants from other continents. In the US, it's over 3,300 species of introduced plants uh, have now escaped into natural areas. This is what uh, White Clay Creek State Park looks like uh, in, in Newark, Delaware. Um, it's one of these parks and preserves that we have here. I took this picture in March uh, when plants from Asia leaf out before plants from North America. So every bit of green you see here in White Clay Creek State Park uh, in March is from Asia. Where did these plants come from? Well, they came from our gardens. This is multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and calorie pear and barberry and privet and miscanthus and, and burning bush. Uh, all the ones I forget, these are the invasive species that we buy in our nurseries and then there they are in the park. And because of host plant specialization, our insects can't eat these guys very well because they haven't been here long enough for our insects to adapt to them. We can measure what happens when we replace native plant communities with plants from outside the local food web. And that's what um, we've been busy doing in, in my lab for the past, who knows what, several, several years. Um, so if you want to look at, at real science, you can go and look up these, these papers, but you don't have to do that. First of all, I know you're not gonna do that, but, but um, you can test this yourself. You know, don't, don't believe everything you hear, believe it or not, everything you hear is not, not correct. You know, maybe, maybe I'm a Russian spy and I'm, I'm just not telling you the truth here. Do it yourself. This is my 12 by 12 experiment. That's what 12 feet by 12 feet looks like when you, when you stake it out. Uh, and here I put it in lawn. You get to determine how much life is gonna exist within that 12 by 12 foot section by determining which plants are there and how many of them. Are there. You can keep it as grass, keep it as lawn, get on your hands and knees on Wednesday, count all of the species that, that are in that space. Uh, won't take you very long. Uh, and then of course on, on Saturday, you mow it and kill them all. Or we could put a plant in there. Let's put a white oak in there. Now here's a white oak I planted from an acorn. It fills that 12 by 12 space very nicely. Um, and by the way, it, it reminds us that oak trees grow. This one's about 25 feet tall. It's only 14 years old in this picture. Um, so let's, let's count the 
caterpillars that occur that we can find just by walking around the tree just at head height. We're not going to climb ladders or anything. So just in this lower section of the tree. And let's do it on July 25th of 2014. We're going to find 410 caterpillars from 19 different species. Then we'll stand back and take that picture right after we finish counting so that um, I can ask you, how many of those caterpillars do you see? None. How much caterpillar damage do you see? None, but they're there. They're there. Over 400 caterpillars just down here. We got a lot up here too. And that is a normal load for, for oaks. Um, of course, you know, if I knocked on your door and said, you've got 410 caterpillars on your, on your oak tree, I know what you'd say. Ah, call the man, get the spray can, kill them all. You don't have to kill them all. This is what oaks do. This is, this is why I've got life in my yard, because they're willing to, to make that much bird food. I met a woman in New Orleans a few years ago named Tammany Baumgarten, who suggested that we all, um, we all take the 10-step the program, take 10 steps back from our trees, uh, and, and uh, then we look at them, and all of the insect damage will disappear. And that's the distance at which we view our trees. You can't see that, that damage. If you look at each individual leaf, it's a little bit there. Okay, next tree we're gonna look at is black cherry. This is another one in, in my yard. We count the, the uh, uh, caterpillars on the lower branches. Same day, 239 caterpillars from 14 different species on our black cherry. Then I went to my neighbor's house uh, and, and wanted to count what was on his calorie pairs. And this was a little bit of a challenge because I had to choose which calorie, calorie pair to, to work with. That's some people know it as Bradford pair. Uh, he's got 32 of them. So um, I chose this one. And same thing, 12 by 12, count the caterpillars on the lower branches. And I bet you think I'm going to tell you there were no caterpillars there. Not so. There was one one little uh, geometric inchworm from, from one species. Uh, then I went to his burning bush. He got a whole row of burning bush, another highly invasive uh, plant from, from uh, China. Um, 12 by 12, counted the caterpillars. I found four caterpillars from one species, four little leaf skeletonizers that are too small to be part of a local food web. Well, that is, we call that one replicate in, in an experiment. The experiment is, um, how many caterpillars do native plants support versus non-native plants? We've done it once. Well, in order to get a real answer, you have to do it a number of times. So let's do it again the next day. Um, same species, we're gonna use different individuals. We're gonna get different numbers, but the same pattern. A whole bunch, 233 in the white oak, 53 in the black cherry, two in the burning bush, one on the calorie pear. And this is the pattern you're gonna get no matter how many times you do it, um, wherever you, you do it. These non-native plants, these introduced plants cannot support our local caterpillars because they haven't been here long enough for caterpillars to adapt to them. And if you think a few years is long enough, it's not. Um, all of the data suggests it's, it's uh, many thousands of years uh, before this type of adaptation occurs. Rick Dark and I were, were driving up from, where were we, Williamsburg, uh, coming north uh, after a talk uh, a few years ago. We drove across the Bay Bridge and we got to the very first establishment you get to is the Sunset Beach Inn and Grill. And here are all the calorie pears that, that they have planted ornamentally, um, very common or ornamental plant still sold uh, a lot, a lot. Uh, well, we stopped, took a picture, then we kept driving right past the Sunset Beach Inn and Grill. And this is a property owned by a land conservancy. And look, it is thoroughly invaded with the offspring from the Sunset Beach Inn and Grill. Uh, and and that's, that's the problem. Come back here. This is biological pollution. This is ecological castration. Um, this, what could be a productive scrub habitat is now, you know, it's, it's almost a monoculture of a plant that's, that's supporting one caterpillar. Um, the chickadee's not going to be able to breed here. And this is the problem. I can drive from New York City down to Richmond and probably below that now uh, when the calorie pear is in bloom and it is white like this all the way down. That's what an invasive species does. And that's why we want to discourage the use of them. Roy Dennis, a, a land manager in England, uh, recently said that land ownership is more than a privilege, it's a responsibility. We do have to be responsible at how we steward the land around us, which means we have to know which plants we should have in our landscapes because all these plants are not equal. Uh, well, uh, several years ago, we, we asked this question, which ones are, are going to be most productive, producing the, you know, the most food for our birds and other things? So we started to rank them by genus um, according to the number of caterpillars recorded in the literature as, as eating each one of these plants. 
we rank them from the most down to the least. These are the, the uh, woody plants in the mid-Atlantic states. And we had so much fun doing this. We did it for every county in the country. And the, those data are now uh, up on the Native Plant Finder, uh, the National Wildlife Federation website. You put in your zip code and the ranked list of those, those plant genera will pop up for your county. Um, the data set was also used by uh, Audubon to make the Plants for Birds um, website. So you can now go and find uh, which plants are best at supporting food webs in, in your county. One of the interesting things that came out of this is that <clears throat> we found that uh, really just a few native plant genera that are making most, most of the, the food. About 5% are making 73 to 75% of all of the, the um, caterpillar species that support our food webs. 14% are making 90% of all the caterpillar species, which means I could build a, a landscape using 95% of the available native plant genera uh, in, in my area, and it would only support 27% of, of the lepidopter of the caterpillars that we actually need. Uh, so I'm calling these plants keystone plants. Um, remember that a, a keystone is the center stone in, uh, in a Roman arch. If you take that stone out, the arch falls down. If you take these keystone genera out of your local food web, it collapses. So uh, here are some of the keystone genera for uh, Ohio. Um, notice I say these are the woody plants and, and herbaceous plants. I say native oaks, native cherries, native birches, native willows. Why don't I just say oaks and cherries? If you go to the, to the nursery and say, I want to buy a cherry, they're probably going to sell you an Asian cherry. Uh, if you say, I want to buy a birch, they'll probably sell you a, a um, European weeping birch. If, they, uh, if you want to buy a willow, they'll probably sell you a weeping willow from, from uh, the Middle East, a, a uh, Japanese maple. You've got to specify that you want a native species of these genera, because if you don't, the caterpillar use is going to be reduced by 65%, even though these are native plant genera. Um, these plants, goldenrods, asters, sunflowers, support a lot of our, our uh, specialist native bees. About a third of our 4,000 species of native bees can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plant genera. Uh, so there's about 40 species that depend on these uh, in any given, given place, uh, particularly in, in Ohio. So if you don't have goldenrods, asters, or sunflowers, uh, particularly perennial sunflowers in your yard, you've just lost 40 species of, of native bees. Top uh, keystone plant in the country is uh, genus Quercus oaks, 557 species supported uh, just in the mid-Atlantic states, over 900 species supported nationwide. There is no other plant genus that comes close to that. So I could plant an oak or I could plant a ginkgo, but ginkgo support no species. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a nice tree, it looks pretty, but uh, it's, it's not contributing to local food webs. And if that's one of the goals of our landscape, and we have to start to think about that now. Uh, second on the list uh, is, is uh, native prunus. Uh, willows are right up there as well. 456 species of caterpillars. So things like black cherry or pin cherry, American plung, compared to zelkova, really common, uh, commonly used ornamental now. That supports no, no species. This is what zelkova looks like. They're all, you know, they're all perfect leaves. And if that's your goal, um, to have, you know, leaves that have no holes in them at all, which, you know, ornamentally, that has always been a goal. Why don't you plant a plastic zilcova? Um, and it'll contribute as much to, to the uh, food web as, as the real one. Pieris japonica used to be the most common foundation plant in uh, all of, of North America. Uh, well, there's a native Pieris. This illustrates an important point. There is a native Pieris. Uh, but it's not very productive, only supports two species. I don't think uh, Pieris japonica supports anything. We could have planted a native viburnum that supports 103 species. Um, so think of the plants you put in your yards as if they are bird feeders, because if you pick the right plants, they can be bird feeders. There you go, they're bird feeders. Now you get to decide how well you're gonna, gonna feed the birds. You can feed them a lot, or you can feed them just a little bit. This is what the landscapes around me look like, giant lawns with very few plants. You also get to decide if you're going to put food in your bird feeders. Uh, in other words, put the plants that support a lot of caterpillars in your yard or keep them empty. Here's the ginkgo back here. It's a big tree, but it's not making any, any bird food. And if we don't landscape with, with uh, this concept of keystone plant in mind, we are not fooling the birds. 
Um, this is this is a study by Desiree Narango, one of my, my uh, recent PhD students who looked at uh, chicken eat reproduction in the suburbs of Washington, DC. Uh, and she was the question she asked was, can you sustain chickadee populations um, in landscapes that are, are loaded with introduced plants versus landscapes loaded with, with native plants? So here's one of her, her uh, chickadee families. The, the star here is where the nest box was. The red line is represents the foraging territory for this pair of birds when they were rearing their young. 95% of their foraging happened within that red line. And it happened on these trees that are outlined in blue. And they are all the native trees in this landscape. Basswood, sweet gum, American elm, black cherry, two species of, of oaks. But there are a lot of other plants in the neighborhood that the chickadees did not do any foraging on. And they're all from Asia. Japanese maple silk tree. There's our friend the ginkgo and, and black poplar, crepe myrtle, saucer magnolia. And it's very easy to picture a landscape where those are the dominant plants. And when that happens, this can happen. Um, this was a failed nest. And after, after Desiree took the three dead chicks out of the nest, they had died from starvation. She noticed a bunch of sunflower seeds at the bottom of the nest. Now remember, chickadee babies cannot eat seeds. And what we think happened is that the parents simply ran out of food in, in the, the landscape they were trying to reproduce in. Somebody had a bird feeder up, so they tried to feed their babies uh, sunflower seeds, but it didn't, it didn't work. So plant choice makes a difference. If you look at, at the uh, number of fledged uh, offspring of, from this study as a function of the percentage of non-native plant biomass in the, in the uh, landscape from no non-natives to 100%, uh, you get almost three, three fledglings per um, leaving the nest when you don't have a lot of, of non-natives around down to pretty close to zero when, when you do. She also compared um, all of these statistics and landscapes that were dominated by natives versus landscapes dominated by introduced plants. When they were dominated by introduced plants, they produced 75% fewer caterpillars. So there's 75% less bird food available for the chickadees. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. So even though there was a nest box up there, the chickadees would come and look and say, well, there's not enough food here. We're not even gonna try. If they did try, those nests contained 1.5 fewer eggs. They were 29% less likely to survive at all. If they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and it delayed maturation by 1.5 days. And if you put all that together in a population growth model, again, as a function of the percentage of non-native plant um, woody biomass in your, in your yard, this is what you get. Uh, this is a replacement rate. This dotted line is the rate at which you have to make babies in order to um, replace the adults that, that die every year. Uh, so if you if you breed at that level, uh, that's a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking. If you breed, if you make more babies than adults die, you have a growing population. But if you make fewer uh, babies than adults die, you've got uh, a shrinking population, unsustainable. Right here is where those those lines overlap, which generously speaking is around 30% non-native plant woody plant biomass. Uh, which means you need, uh, if you have more than 30% non-native woody plant biomass, you're into this, this um, declining unsustainable section of the graph here, which means, you know, roughly we need about 70% of our landscapes, the woody plants in our landscapes to be productive native plants. Uh, but, but this suggests there is an area of compromise. You can have your ginkgo, you can have your crepe myrtle, can't have any invasive plants, but you can have some non-native plants, those accents that we all love, uh, without destroying local local bird food um, or, or uh, food webs for birds, as long as they don't dominate the landscape. That's compromise. Compromise is, is a good thing. If my, if my message was you can't have any non-native plants, very few people would be listening. Desiree also looked at the number of migrating birds that stopped in her study sites during this study. There were 51 species that stopped. Uh, and what they're doing is arresting. You know, these migrants have flown all night long up to 300 miles in a single night if they've got a tailwind. And when they come down, people say they got to rest. But what they really have to do is gas up. They're out of gas. They've got to eat. And what are they eating? They're eating caterpillars. And if they come down in the land of ginkgo, they're out of luck. If you've ever seen a, a little bird sitting on the ground shivering, um, it's probably a migrant. And it simply has uh, not enough energy to look, go look for food. Uh, and, and that means that, you know, the plants you put in your yard are critical, not just for resident birds like chickadees, but for migrants as well. You, you may say, I don't have a property big enough to support a breeding bird. And that might be true. 
Uh, but if you have a property big enough to support um, a single tree and you make it the right tree, you can support migrating birds and they will use your tree. So it doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you really can save it where you live. We have moved plants and animals all over the world, creating what Richard Hobbs calls novel ecosystems. You might have heard that term. And that simply means that the organisms in our ecosystems today are, are just meeting each other for the first time in evolutionary history. In other words, they have not been together long enough to develop the specialized relationships that are nature. Uh, which means um, there's a lot of species disappearing from our current ecosystems. Novel ecosystems are not supporting the specialized relationships that uh, we've talked about so much. Which means, leads me to the question, how many species do we need? You know, so what if these species disappear from our ecosystems? How many do we need? I'm going to argue that we need all of them. We need all of them because it is the plants and the animals in our ecosystems that create ecosystem services that keep humans around. The biodiversity are running the ecosystems that make those ecosystem services. There was a huge study way back in, it came out in 2005, took five years to pull it off with hundreds of scientists from around the world called the Millennial Ecosystem Assessment. And the idea was to measure the, the planet's ability to produce the ecosystem services that we humans needed. And their unhappy conclusion way back in 2005 is that we've already degraded the planet's uh, ability to support us by 60%. Hasn't gotten any better. Believe me, that's the same as taking planet Earth and shrinking it by 60%. At the same time, we keep increasing our, our populations at a, at a dramatic rate, not sustainable. So what we need to do is rebuild the Earth's ability to support us, rebuild its carrying capacity, its ability to support life, uh, which means we have to raise the bar about what we're asking our landscapes to do. In the past, we've asked them to be pretty. That's pretty much it, um, and that's okay. Well, that's not okay, but we could still ask them to, to be pretty, but now they have to do these other things. They have to support life. They have to support viable food webs. They have to sequester carbon, pull that carbon out of the air and, and pump it into the, the soil because it's not doing us any good up in the, up in the air. They've got to clean and, and manage uh, the water in our watershed. They've got to enrich our soil and they've got to support pollinators. These are things that uh, every, every landscape has to do. We're not talking about good land stewardship here. We're talking about essential land stewardship that, that we have to start doing on every inch of planet Earth, including landscapes like this. So if, you're, if your yard doesn't generate all the ecosystem services that you, you use, you're going to have to borrow them from someplace else. You're not going to borrow them from your neighbor because he's not making any either. You're probably not going to borrow them from your, your township's open space, if it looks like my township's open space, which is a giant lawn with a paved path around it and people walk in circles around it. This is a, a house down the street from me, <clears throat> and um, that's a calorie pair, by the way. There are no food webs here. There's very little carbon sequestration. Grass is the worst carbon sequester compared to almost any other plant. Uh, this guy is actively destroying my watershed, and there are no pollinators here. We can't afford to keep doing that. And this is my neighbor's yard. This is where I did the, the uh, uh, study on his calorie pair. Every one of the plants he's put on his 10 acres is a non-native plant. Not that he knows it. He simply, he, he goes to the nursery and he looks for something that's pretty. He wants to fit in with the neighbors and they're all doing this. So he looks for, you know, a pretty plant. Maybe it can be a screen or anchor or a focal point, but it's all about aesthetics. And we've done that forever. No thought to the ecological role that our, our plants have to start playing in our landscapes. <clears throat> but he could find pretty plants that are supplying uh, uh, ecosystem services. They've got food web value, watershed value. They're helping pollinators. They, uh, there's uh, active uh, natural enemy um, uh, populations. All of those things, you know, it's just a few of the circles I could put up here that our, our yards need to start doing. So what does a, a biodiversity friendly neighborhood look like? Um, these th three things have to happen. We have to uh, put enough um, enough powerhouse plants into our, our private property so that we create biological carters that connect the habitat fragments that remain out there, connect them with each other. Uh, and if we do that everywhere, those, those fragments aren't isolated anymore, which means the population within them won't be tiny anymore. So when they fluctuate, they won't disappear anymore. This is the most important thing that we need to do to stop the steady dream stream of 
steady loss of species from our, our local ecosystems. Um, that means we have to reduce the area that's in, in lawn because lawn's not accomplishing any of those things. We have uh, about 40 million acres in lawn. That's uh, the size of, of New England. Um, dead space, dead space. And we have to begin the transition of, of uh, using from all of these non-native ornamentals to uh, productive native plants. In the past, what we've done is, is build our house, and then we put in a few trees here, a foundation planting, and then we're exhausted, no more landscaping. So everything by default becomes, becomes lawn. We've done that for a century. Let's turn that on its head. Let's build the house and figure out where we do want lawn. I am not suggesting we get rid of, of turf grass because it has a function. You put lawn where you're gonna walk. So figure out where you're gonna use your yard. If you wanna get married in the front yard, you have to have some, some lawn in the front yard. Uh, if you wanna walk to the backyard, you need a grass path, throw the Frisbee, have a barbecue, wherever you're gonna use the yard, that's where you put lawn. Then everything else by default becomes heavily planted. And if your neighbors do the same thing, now you've got that connectivity with the, the woodlot over here and the woodlot over here. Um, we still have our lawn. We can still play with our lawnmowers. It'll, it'll be okay. But if we replace half the area in lawn, if we've got 40 million acres and we replace half of it, that's 20 million acres we can do serious conservation on. 20 million acres is the size of, of uh, um, the Adirondacks plus Yellowstone plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains, add up all these parks, less than 20 million acres. And if we do this at home by removing grass, by removing our lawn, half of our lawn, we can create a new national park. It'll be the biggest national park in the country. We can call it Homegrown National Park. So let's do that. Let's take areas like this. This is the entrance to the uh, Toledo Zoo. Uh, I believe it's the Toledo Zoo. Uh, it's got nice grass and, and dandelions here and put some, some, uh, some nice native plants in there. You know, the, the, um, the zoo did this without consulting the board of directors and the board had a fit. They said, nobody's gonna come to the zoo anymore. Yeah, it's hard to change culture. We can, we can take these, these square things out uh, and, and build a landscape. This is actually a high-end house. I should have included more of it in the picture on Fisher's Island. Um, Well-to-do well folks live there. Uh, and this landscaping is doing everything I just talked about with the exception of supporting pollinators. Oaks are wind pollinated, so they're not, they're not making a lot of pollinators. Um, so let's put in a pollinator garden and there it is. We've, we've covered, covered our bases. Uh, this is the, the current uh, land ethic in much of agriculture throughout the country. We've gotten rid of the native plants that we call weeds, like, like uh, milkweed and, and our asters and our evening primrose and, and all the things that support our monarchs and our 4,000 species of native bees and planted grass because we need more grass. But we can replace that. This is in Iowa where they've, they've uh, got a, a substantial roadside program to put prairie plantings in. And they've gotten over a thousand miles of roadways this way. So it can be restored. This is a mulch sculpture that proves you can't use native plants in a, a formal setting. Except nobody told the folks in, in Indianapolis, um, this is an all native garden in a formal setting. And it's the first year of the, of the planting too, it hasn't even grown in. Remember, formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in, in um, formal gardens in Europe all the time. And I guess it's okay because they're non-native plants over there. This is a corporate landscape, invites the, the, the homeowner or the, the employees to come out at, at noon to get sunburn, but it could be a setting like this. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's fascinating studies that, that have shown that there are measurable medical benefits to spending 15 minutes in a landscape like this. Your blood pressure goes down, your stress hormone, your cortisol is, is decreased, um, your cancer is cured, uh, you don't get divorced anymore. Uh, and, and, you know, you think I'm kidding. Google, Google medical benefits of native plants and a lot of literature comes up and it's really pointing in that direction. Uh, so it's where I'm going to put mental health up here, but you can put physical health up there too. If you put a, a, a plant outside of a hospital window, the patient gets better faster. If you put a, a tree outside of a classroom, test scores go up. I'm not making this up. They do. Why? Well, people have scratched their head for a long time, but apparently when we are exposed to nature on any level, our stress level goes down. And when we have lower stress, we do everything better. 
Uh, by the way, if you want to join Homegrown National Park, we have a new website here, homegrownnationalpark. It's actually, yeah, .org. Um, and uh, you, can, you can put in your data. Uh, you can join for free, by the way, and um, your little your little piece of the of the world that you are are restoring with native plants will pop up on on the map. Um, we hope it will be a lot of fun. We can see the map fill in, see see restoration happen. Does your yard have to be 100% native? No, it doesn't have to be 100% native. It's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It is the absence of native plants. So get those native plants in your yard. Uh, here's a good example. This is crepe myrtle, of course. It's a beautiful plant, perfect decoration, the quintessential decoration. It comes in any color. It's got exfoliating bark. It's not invasive, doesn't move, uh, but it's biologically dead. Nothing eats, it, eats its leaves. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I liken it to a, a statue. Um, but how many statues do you want in, in your yard? You know, a few, okay, but, but you, can, you can go overboard. How do you know when you've succeeded? Uh, well, there's a lot of ways to measure when you've succeeded, but this has got to be one of them. When you have holes in your leaves. This is holistic gardening, uh, according to Greg Nace at the Pittsburgh Botanical Garden. This is a shingle oak leaf from, from my yard and a caterpillar has eaten part of the leaf and now that caterpillar is in the belly of a bird. I have life in my yard because this plant was willing to share some of the energy it captured from the sun. If you look at your leaves and there's nothing eaten out of them, you've got a, a dead food web. Uh, all the energy is captured in your plants and it's not moving, moving out. If you have fireflies or, or lightning bugs come back, people ask me all the time, where are the fireflies that I used to have when I was a child? Uh, well, you know, lightning bugs, fireflies, they're not flies or bugs. They are beetles. That's what the adult looks like. And that's what the larva looks like. It um, looks like a little dinosaur, but it is a predator in leaf litter. So look around your yard. If you don't have any leaf litter, you don't have where they, where they live and eat, eat uh, invertebrates. If you have lights on all the time, you've messed up their adult reproduction. And if you use a, a lawn service, um, you've poisoned them. So if you have fireflies, you're doing lots of things right. Uh, but this is the this is the best measure of all. If you have birds breeding on your property, because you can't have birds breeding on your property unless you have the food that supports them. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop now with with by saying that we really can save nature, but only if we learn to to live with it. Fortunately. Nature is turning out to be a lot more malleable, a lot more resilient, a lot more forgiving than I ever thought she would, she would be. But I do think she's going to give us one more chance. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Doug. A really great, uh, great session. So many uh, positive comments in the chat box. I know you couldn't see all those, but uh, from the very start. And um, they're calling it the Talamy Wrap. Some people were asking you to go slower, but that, I know that's your style, all these wonderful caterpillars and um, just, <laughs> just wonderful. So uh, we have lots of questions in the chat box. I'm sorry that I didn't, folks, give you kind of an overview of how we're going to take the questions. Um, if you need to hop off now, feel free to do that. We're going to record the questions and we'll post that on to the website. So you won't miss anything. You can come back and uh, review that later. But we'll spend maybe a 30 minutes or so, as long as we can um, get Doug to, to keep answering questions, um, working through some of those questions. If you open the Q&A box, you'll see that there's an option to thumbs up some of those questions. So if you see a question that you want answered, you can thumbs up that and it kind of makes it rise to the top. I know we won't get through all of our 72 questions. Um, Doug, can you start um, by talking about how you find all those caterpillars in your yard and kind of how big your yard is? The yard's 10 acres. Uh, and and I know that makes you think, well, this isn't going to work on, on smaller acreage. But in another talk, I tell you exactly the opposite. It works on, on everything from all size properties. You can increase the, the amount of biodiversity with those plants. Um, so we have 10 acres, but I, I uh, find caterpillars. I, you know, I don't take all those pictures in one day. Uh, I know when to look. It's experience. We, we, we you learn um, what we call a search image. You know how to look for them. Caterpillars are doing their best to hide from birds. So they are, they are blending in with the leaves. Most caterpillars that taste good are on the underside of the leaf. So the bird can't see them from the top. So you turn the leaf over. First, you look for a little 
caterpillar damaged some of the holes in the leaves. And then you start to look for the caterpillar that made that damage. A lot of caterpillars only feed at night. So they crawl off the leaf during the day. They're either hiding in the bark or some of them actually crawl off the plant altogether and then come back on at night. So if you go out with a flashlight at night, um, you'll, see, you'll see caterpillars. Timing is important too. Don't look for caterpillars in, in May or early June because that's when the birds are, are taking thousands of them every day. Uh, so they're gone at that point. Look for them after they've rebounded the end of July, early August. That's when the caterpillar populations are the highest. Uh, but a lot of them look like, you know, curled leaves, the edges of leaves or, or leaf damage. Uh, and you just get used to, to looking for that and you will find them. Great, thanks, Doug. Um, another question, um, Amanda shares that, uh, hi, Doug, you are my hero. Mm -hmm. And she wants to know about the difference between straight species and cultivars. Her question is specifically about shrubs and how to find some of those um, natives that are not cultivars, but just your feel on, on the value of, of cultivars versus straight species. Okay, we did, we did a study asking exactly that question and we did work with woody plants. We worked with shrubs and trees. Uh, so we weren't looking at, at, at uh, flower changes. A cultivar, by the way, is a genetic variant of a straight species, which is different from a hybrid. A hybrid is a cross between two species. Uh, so if you're just looking at a genetic variant of a, a native plant, <clears throat> the question is, is that as, as ecologically productive as the straight species? Uh, well, there, there are not that many types of, of uh, genetic changes that are, are used to make cultivars. We looked at six of them. One is to make a tall plant short, introduce disease resistance, make the leaf variegated, enhance fall color, um, take a green leaf and make it red or purple, increase berry size. I think that was was six. Those are the, the traits that we looked at. And we had a big common garden experiment where we put the straight species in the middle and we put all the cultivars around it. And then we, we measured insect use for three years. And the only consistent cultivar trait that, that consistently reduced insect use was taking a green leaf and making it red or purple. And that's because you're loading the leaf with anthocyanins, which are feeding deterrents. Uh, so we love our, our red leaf uh, cultivars, but um, That'd be a good one to, to avoid if you want to, uh, to really support those caterpillars. Uh, Annie White has worked with, with flower changes. She's from the University of Vermont and uh, there the, the, um, the results are not so positive. When you start messing with the shape and the color and the nutrient value of flowers, you're, you're interrupting or, or, or you're messing up those specialized relationship between all the specialist bees and those particular plants. Um, so more often than not, cultivar changes to flowers. When you make an echinacea look like a zinnia, chances are, are pretty good. It's going to mess up the, the pollinators. Not always, though. There are cases where a cultivar actually has more nectar than the straight species. So it's, it, the answer really is it depends on what the genetic trait was. Uh, I'd love to see nurseries carry straight species uh, along with the cultivar so that you as the consumer get to decide if you're landscaping a part of your yard for function as opposed to beauty, uh, you ought to be able to, to buy the plants that, that we know are going to work. We know the straight species work. Uh, so if you go to the nursery and say, well, you know, I want to buy, I want to buy hydrangea arborescence, straight species, not Annabelle. And they say, well, we only have Annabelle. They say, okay, goodbye. And if enough people do that, they say, I'm missing some sales here. I will carry the straight species. That's what's going to turn it around. They don't want to carry plants that nobody's going to buy. Great, thanks, Doug. So Jane asks, why are so many caterpillars colorful, spiny, hairy, et cetera? It seems to make them more obvious. Yes, the colorful ones uh, usually taste bad. Not all caterpillars taste good. That's why monarchs are colorful. They're, you know, things that eat milkweeds are typically yellow and black or orange and black. They are advertising the fact that they taste bad because milkweeds taste bad. That's called episomatic coloration. Uh, the caterpillars that are spiny, uh, that's obvious. They, they don't want to make it easy uh, for the bird to, to swallow it. And a lot of those spines make it hard for parasitoids, little teeny wasps, to get onto their back and, and lay eggs. Uh, birds are eating a lot of caterpillars, but those parasitoids are killing more caterpillars than anything else. So a lot of adaptations are against uh, parasitization. 
Okay, Shannon asked, do different species of caterpillars have different levels of carotenoids and or different proteins, vitamins, minerals, etc. So that having lots of different caterpillar species is important, not just to spread out the risk of a single species failure, but also for the same nutritional reasons that we need a diverse diet. That is a wonderful hypothesis. And if I had to guess, I'd say yes, uh, but nobody studied that. Nobody has studied that. <laughs> Good PhD. That's good. Okay, Sandra has a, a Bradford pear. Um, do you recommend removing that? Yes, I do. Um, you know, I, I, I there's not all non-natives that I would run out and cut down, but Bradford pear is one of them. It's one of the most invasive plants we have. Those fruits do not stay on your property. The the mockingbirds eat them over the winning winter, and then they go poop them out someplace else. So it's. Uh, it's a it's serious biological pollution, and um, if you remove it, that's good land stewardship. You know, in in uh, 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 St. Louis, Missouri, and Fayetteville, Arkansas, there's a bounty on calorie pears. If you take one down, they give you a free tree replacement. Maybe you can get that going where you where you live. <laughs> that's a great idea. Uh, Cassandra asks, how do you recommend thinking about balancing different species of plants in the yard versus having multiples of the same plant when you have limited space? Yeah, that's a real good question. So good, I'm going to write it down so that I answer it later on. Uh, you know, a, a good example would be milkweeds. Everybody wants to plant milkweed for, for, uh, for monarchs, uh, but a lot of times they plant one milkweed rabbit. Now, eventually that'll spread into a milkweed patch, but the monarch comes, it flies by your yard. It's a female. She sees a milkweed, she lays an egg on it. Then she goes looking for another milkweed. She flies around, oh, there's one. It's the same one she just laid on. And she ends up laying four or five eggs on that single plant, which is not enough plant to support that many larvae. So they end up stripping it and then they starve because they don't have enough, enough plant. So it depends on what you're trying to support, but for, for things like monarchs, they're pretty big caterpillars. They eat a lot. You got to have a milkweed patch that's not going to run out of, of food. Um, uh, but, you know, limited space, I would say there is a, a minimum uh, amount of biomass that you need in order to succeed. So that means you're going to suffer in terms of, of diversity. But if you make, if you, if you focus, that's a good time to focus on those keystone plants. So make that those few species that you have really count. But um, more often than not, unless, you know, an oak tree, that's a big plant. You don't need more than one of those to get enough biomass. So, it, you know, it depends on, on uh, what the species is and, and uh, how much space you really have. You're muted. You're muted. The most common phrase said last year, you're on mute. Um, <laughs> Nancy says that you've compiled a wonderful list of trees and shrubs that feed the most caterpillar species, um, but she wonders for birds or other wildlife that are endangered, are there um, a list of specific plants to help those specific species? I, I don't think so, but you know, birds are predators and predators can't afford to be quite as specialized as, as leaf eaters are because they have to eat a lot of different prey. Uh, so birds aren't aren't that fussy. They're going to eat any caterpillar that uh, is not well defended and tastes good. Uh, so, so it's not like they, they need particular species of caterpillars. There are some bird specialists like cuckoos, the yellow bill and black bill cuckoo specialize on hairy caterpillars. Hair is one of the most common ways caterpillars protect themselves from, from birds because most birds don't like hairy caterpillars. The hairs get dislodged in their esophagus and their stomach. But cuckoos have the ability to throw up their esophagus lining and their stomach lining periodically and get rid of all those hairs. So they specialize on, on caterpillars like the tent caterpillar and the fall webworm that most other things don't like. And that gives them lots to eat all the time. But most birds don't specialize and they'll eat pretty much anything. So I don't think that list exists. Uh, Patricia comments that uh, my local tree nurseries have been saying it's best to plant non-native trees because diseases are destroying elms, cherries, maples, and oaks. She Where asked do you for, think those diseases came from? <laughs> <sighs> those diseases are non-native diseases that we brought in with those non-native plants. The, you know, the classic example is um, dogwood anthracnose. They say, oh, you got to plant you got to plant uh, Kusa dogwood because anthracnose kills the the Florida dogwood. 
well, Kusadog, we brought in the effect and You know, it just seems so unfair. And by the way, our 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 uh, Florida dogwoods, most of the ones that exist now are, are pretty resistant to it, but um, your nurseryman does not know what those plants need to be doing. You might as well pave over your yard if you're going to plant something that nothing can use. So what we need to do is get resistance in our native plants uh, and, and uh, there are plenty of native plants that do have resistance and not going to die just because you plant them. I don't know. You hit it. You hit a nerve on that one. <laughs> the second part of her question was, how do you find sources for those native plants? And I, I know you don't want to recommend specific nurseries, but just approaches that people can use to find those native plants in their state or region. Um, you know, every state has a native plant society and they're a, a wonderful source. But today with with the Google, it is just a great thing. Ask for native plants in your county and you'll get a list that pops up right away. That wasn't true a few years ago, but um, it's pretty easy to get that that information now. But you know, if you go to your native plant society and, and ask the same question, they know who, who the reputable dealers are and where they are. That's also a very good uh, approach. Or, you know, extension agents, they should know that, right? <laughs> Uh, Doug, there are um, multiple questions about oak. So I wonder if you could just t spend a few minutes giving a little bit of an overview of the book coming out. There are questions about, are pin oaks valuable? What are some smaller oaks? How do I find best oaks for my region? Uh, what are the benefits of oaks? Um, oh boy, <laughs> that's, I know, that's a, a book. A, yeah. a two minute uh, synopsis of yeah. uh, months and months of work. Okay, the new book is is the nature of oaks, and what I do is is follow the nature on my oaks in my yard every month of the year. I started in October, and I look what's happening in October. Then I go to November, December, and I go right through the the year. And in the course of doing that, the object is to to convince people that um, planting an oak can be really entertaining. You get to you get to look at you know the most productive plant in our area. Um, and you know when you know what you're looking for, you'll see a whole lot, a whole lot more. That and 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 that's supposed to motivate you to go out and plant oaks. What do oaks do for us? They manage the watershed better than anything else because they've got giant root systems. Uh, they are the best supporters of our food web. They sequester more carbon than than anything else. The only thing they don't do uh, very well is support the pollinators. Except that's not a dead end either because there's recent research that is showing that oaks are wind pollinated, but there are a number of bees that actually go and gather that pollen anyway in the spring and, and they do eat oak pollen. So um, oaks are doing uh, an awful lot of things. Small oaks, um, I got an older species, an older book about oaks. Somebody gave it to me after I wrote the book on oaks. And I wrote down, there are two pages of species of oaks that are either ground covers or small shrubs. Uh, a lot of them are in the West and a lot of them very localized, but we could get those into uh, the, the trade pretty easily. You know, you get the acorn and, and you grow it. There was also a, a report came out, I don't know, two, three weeks ago. A third of the oaks in the world are now endangered uh, because so many have restricted um, distributions and we, you know, we just would plow them over. So, uh, so their conservation value in planting some of these, these rare oaks uh, and certainly a lot of, of uh, ecological value. Okay, sorry, I'm making notes trying to keep up here. So um, can you talk about mealworms and their value for birds? There are a few questions about that. That'll give me a chance to take a, a breather here. Mealworms are beetles. So if you, if you look, well, if you go back and memorize the, the graph I showed you, um, carotenoid level is pretty low in mealworms because they're not eating green leaves. They are uh, have a lot of protein, they have a lot of fat, uh, and when we have terrible, terrible weather, which we seem to have every spring now, uh, and there just aren't a lot of caterpillars around, you put out mealworms, your bluebirds and other things will take them. You can save the day with, with them, but keep in mind, the person who asked about a balanced diet, if you only feed your birds mealworms, uh, that's not balanced at, at all. Uh, and birds are lazy too. When you put them out in a little tray and they don't have to go search all of the, the branches for, for a caterpillar, they're saving a lot of energy by doing that. So they will go get your mealworms first. So I would say supplement with mealworms, particularly during uh, cool, wet weather. 
uh, but but um, I wouldn't make a habit of it. The birds, of course, you've got to have the right plants making the caterpillars too. If you don't have them in your yard, then you can you put a lot of mealworms out until you grow them. But um, it's it's uh, good food, not great food, and you don't want it to be the only thing they eat. Okay, Jesse shares that in the past I've bought several of the genera listed on the native plant finder at my local nursery, but different um, precise species or varieties. So different uh, solidagos, uh, monardas, etc. How important is an exact match? You know, oh, it's not a, it's not important at all. The the plants on that finder are just just uh, recommendations, and we're actually reworking that website to address that very very problem. We don't want to suggest that that's the only one that's good. Um, the, the, most of the plants in the genus are going to be highly productive and you want to pick the species that are best in, in your area. So that's a, you know, it's another whole level of, of uh, web working that, that uh, is going to, going to happen one of these days. But um, yes, there's a lot of species of, of goldenrod and there's reasons to pick different ones. So for example, Canada goldenrod is really aggressive. If you pick that, it's a great plant for nature, but it's going to take over your garden. And you probably don't want that. So I would pick one of the, the bunch goldenrods that is not going to spread stoloniferously so much, which are also great plants, great for pollinators and great for caterpillars, but they won't take over your garden. So that's where a little bit of extra knowledge uh, comes in. But don't take the recommendation, the examples on that website uh, to heart. They're just examples. Okay, Maria asks about fruit trees, apples, persimmons, figs, uh, and uh, their usefulness for birds. Uh, great, uh, that's an, it's, a, it's really another subject, but um, after birds reproduce, uh, birds can't rear their young on fruit, on sugar. You know, they need, they need protein and they need, they need fat. Now, some berries have fat, but usually in the spring, those berries are very low in fat. That's why they, they move to insects. But after they have reproduced, then they do want a lot of carbohydrates. And that's when you know, things like blueberries uh, are produced with a lot of sugar. Um, in the fall, birds require um, berries high in fat for two reasons. If they're migrating, the fat fuels that migration. And if they're not migrating, the fat helps them uh, build up fat stores to get through the winter. So berries like uh, those produced by our viburnums, by our dogwoods, uh, by our Virginia creeper, Parthenocissus, uh, poison ivy berries. Those are all really good for our, our birds. Uh, so I don't wanna imply that birds are only eating insects. They're reproducing mostly on insects, but reproduction is an important time. You don't have it, you don't have birds in a couple of generations. So, uh, but, but yes, berry making plants are, are good too. Okay. Um, what suggestions do you have for uh, reaching out to others to help change minds? So nursery, <laughs> neighborhood associations, neighbors, uh, partners, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I, you know, I've been trying to do that for more than a decade now. Um, and, and it is a challenge because the people who need their minds change the most, never come to the talks and they don't come to the webinars. And so how do you reach those people? That's one of the reasons actually that, that uh, Michelle Alfandari is the one who, who talked me into doing this website. She's done, you know, 99% of the work because she said, you've got to get beyond the choir uh, or if this is going to work. And she's absolutely right. So she says, you've got to use social media, uh, which I, don't, but she's doing um, Instagram and other things to, to make it a, a social activity. I do see a change in, in the last decade. Um, so culture is really hard to change, but I do see a change. The, the demand for native plants is, is through the roof. Uh, it's exceeding uh, um, supply at this point. Uh, it's not to the point where you can drive down the street and see that everybody's got an all native native garden. But I do think we're going to reach a threshold where it becomes common enough uh, and we're going to find ways to do it that are acceptable enough so that people will start to do it because their neighbor is doing it. There have been sociological studies that show the most important feature in changing somebody's mind is what your neighbor does. People want to fit in with their, their neighborhood. So if your neighbor starts doing this, then, it's, then it becomes uh, socially acceptable. We could change minds overnight by changing the tax structure. Um, if, 
you got a, a tax benefit for having a smaller lawn or for planting oaks or for doing any of the things that, that support our, our, uh, our watersheds and our, you know, increase the ecological value of your yard, people would do it right away, even if it's not much money because that right away said, this is a culturally acceptable thing. This is the right thing to do. Um, and this is why the municipalities that support it uh, are having such an, an important impact. Minnesota, for example, has a, a cost sharing program where they're, they're, they help homeowners pay to replace all or part of their lawn with appropriate prairie plantings. Uh, that, you know, that's a big message saying, this is okay. Your, your neighbor's not gonna yell at you because the state's paying you to do this. Uh, so programs like that, having that, that bounty on calorie pair, uh, that's what's gonna change minds faster than anything. Okay, there, um, there's a question about uh, non-native praying mantids. So would you recommend destroying Chinese praying mantid uh, egg masses in order to help the native mantids? You know, I'm in the age, age group that grew up thinking you got a $50 fine if you killed a praying mantid. And this was up in New Jersey. And the only praying mantids we had were Chinese mantids. We didn't know, yeah, we didn't know they were, where they were from. They are an invasive species and they sit on our flowers. They eat our honeybees and the other bees that come in. They eat our monarchs. They eat hummingbirds. It's a big predator that uh, never used to be here. And of course, they're here um, causing the same kind of problems that other invasive plants do. So ecologically, yeah, we don't really want them around. But make sure you know the difference between a Chinese manid and a Carolina manid. Uh, we do have other species of manids in this country. They're all smaller than the Chinese manid. The Chinese manid is the one that, that makes that globular egg mass that right now, if you go out and look in your field or on your fence post or something, the, these globular egg masses, that's the best time to get rid of them. Just collect those egg masses and put them in the freezer. Um, it's harder to kill the adult, you know, I get that. Don't buy them though. Some people sell them and you know, you put them in your garden, they're supposed to control, I don't know what, the only thing they do is eat your, eat your bees, so. Okay, could you comment on the role of annuals, annual flowers and even garden vegetables in, um, in toward biodiversity and providing food for birds? Um, annuals, uh, you know, I'll group them with, with perennials too. Um, are critically important for our, our you know, getting the, uh, those pollinator gardens going in your, your yard. Now, there are a number of woody plants that are essential to pollinators, but typically when you talk about building a pollinator garden, people are looking at annuals or perennials. One of the hardest things to accomplish in supporting pollinators is to have blooms available all season long. You know, there's a, a sequence of species of bees that want to use your yard and they need something to eat all the time. So if you go through a dead period in your yard where nothing's blooming and that's that's easy to do in the middle of the summer, it can be hard to get blooms. Uh, that's where annuals can, can really uh, fill in um, because we've got a lot of species that bloom in the spring and a lot of species that bloom in the fall and not that many that bloom in the middle of the summer. So annuals can be an important component there. Uh, as far as caterpillars go, you know, the records on, on they call them low plants. So even perennials and, and annuals, they're not nearly as good as they are on woody plants because uh, a lot of people that collect caterpillars don't know their plants very well. They just say eats low, low plants and that's not really helpful. But a lot of the plants they eat are annuals and um, that database is, is improving, but it's, but it's not great. So annuals, are, are good, but you know, if you're if you're putting in uh, a few annuals versus an oak tree, the oak's going to supply a lot more biomass over the years for a much longer period of time, and that's why its ecological value is going to be higher. Great, Doug. Another really wonderful session, folks. We have one more question that we're going to field, but uh, in the meantime, if you could, in the chat bot, in the chat box, please put a a thank you in for Doug for a wonderful session. I've also shared in there uh, a couple times some um, links that we've talked about today. I'll also send it out in a follow-up email and post those on our um, on our webpage so you can access those um, some of those resources. Uh, Doug, always appreciate um, your knowledge and uh, always learn new things. I think you do such a great job of getting people enthused about um, about this important work. Uh, the question that um, I'll sort of answer. Uh, 
with a commercial for the Living Landscape Speaker Series is uh, someone's questions, a question about um, how can we incorporate these plants in landscapes? How can we design them um, into landscapes so that they're beautiful? And um, uh, I'll get your comments on that as well, Doug, but just wanted to point out folks that we have Deborah Napke. Um, Deborah Knapke is a, a landscape designer and author, and she's going to be speaking on week three of this series, as well as the wonderful Rick Dark, who um, has done some incredible projects like the High Line in New York City and others um, that really demonstrate how native plants can be beautiful and, um, and useful, as well as uh, so important in, um, in the environment. Doug, your thoughts well, that, on it, that is, yeah, that's how I'll answer that. And that is, don't ask me, ask a landscape, a trained landscape designer or landscape architect. I had an interesting visit years ago when I first started talking about this and people would ask me and I, you know, I'd speculate, oh, do this, do that. And this woman came into my, my office late in the day and she was a landscape designer. She said, she said, don't ruin your reputation by talking about landscape design because you don't know what you're talking about. And you know, I, she's right. She's right. I don't talk to Rick, talk to talk to lots of, of, you know, a lot of landscape designers out there. I know what your, your landscape should accomplish, but there's no one landscape design that that would do that. And that depends on, on an interaction between your designer, between the homeowner, what you want, what you value a thousand uh, solutions to any one ecological problem. So that's why that's a hard question to answer, period. So yeah, don't ask me. <laughs> so another thanks to Doug. I think Doug, you said this was uh, one of the largest webinars um, that you've you've been. I believe it know. was. There was one in in uh, Florida that was seventeen hundred. Did we beat seventeen hundred? I think we were over two. Yeah. At the, at okay. The well, that that does it. You got the you got the prize. <laughs> Um, yep. Folks, next week, uh, we're going to have Marnie Tichenau, who's a wildlife specialist with Ohio State University, talking about how to incorporate elements for birds into our gardens, how to use feeders and nesting boxes and uh, natural habitat to get more, uh, more birds into our landscapes, which we're thinking about, um, uh, especially now that we're spending lots of time at home. So thanks, everybody, for right. joining us, Doug. Another thanks to you. And okay. um, uh, love the work. All, that right. You do. All right. Thank you. Take care.